So this morning we have two, uh, two speakers. Uh, first of all is uh, Wei Tai Kwok, who will be speaking on understanding U.S.-China commitments under the U.N. Paris Climate Agreement. Wei Tai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here today. Um, Ten years ago, uh, my wife and I went down to the movie theater to see a film called An Inconvenient Truth. And I wonder how many people happen to have seen that film by a show of hands. Uh, it's a film about how former Vice President Gore, after he lost the election, uh, he decided to go out and give presentations to educate the public on the facts around the climate crisis. Somebody decided to say, hey, let's make a movie of him giving this slideshow presentation. And they did. And that movie won an Academy Award. And he himself later won a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to educate the public on the climate crisis. Well, when Violet and I, my wife and I, when we walked out of the movie theater that night, there were two thoughts that came to my mind. Number one is that if what he said was true, then we don't have 100 years to solve this problem, probably more like 30 to 40 years. And oh, you're all reading the warning. OK, sorry <laughs> about that. I didn't even see that up there. Let me see. Going the wrong way here. All right, there, that's better. OK. Um, so um, the other thing was that if we don't have 100 years, maybe 30 or 40 years, that uh, I thought about my children at the time who were six and nine years old. Gareth on the left, he was in kindergarten. My daughter, Shelly, was in third grade uh, with my mother there. And you know, you're all teachers, right? So you know what teachers do to parents. When we go to Parents' Day, we have to dress up goofy like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're, they're really. If we only have 30, 40 years, it, it's going to be too late for my kids to try to solve this problem, right? And so I felt a sudden burden on my shoulders, like, oh my gosh, the adults of today, we have to be the ones that sit up and address this problem because it'll be too late for our children. Uh, so uh, at the time, I was the head of my own advertising agency in San Francisco. I loved my job. I was enjoying, uh, I, I had been there 17 years. It was my own company. But I realized I wanted to be part of the solution to the climate crisis. And uh, somehow every day when I got home from work and I was tired and I asked myself, gee, what did I do today to be part of the solution to this <coughs> climate crisis? And I realized I had done absolutely nothing to be a part of that solution. And uh, as they return home every day, every day like that, thinking, gee, I did nothing again today. And yet we only have 30 years. I realized that I had to, I was not only not part of the solution, I was part of the problem. And I realized then and there that I had to quit my job and quit my career and do something different if I was going to be part of the solution. So eventually I did quit my job to join uh, in the solar and renewable energy industry. And I also ended up being a volunteer for Al Gore's Climate Reality Project to become a public speaker to speak with audiences like yourself about, to share the facts about the climate crisis. So, um, so that's a little bit of my background. And um, I wanted to start off with a little quiz for you all, because I know you all love quizzes and tests. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you're all so excellent at it. So here's the first question. Um, what country is the world's largest emitter of CO2 pollution? Is it the Falkland Islands? Is it Russia? Is it the United States, China, or India? C, the, the, the world, C. Oh, OK, I'm hearing two different things here. All right, well, right now, what is, right now? Woo, D, all right. So the answer is, uh, as depicted on this chart, uh, the bigger the bubble, the bigger a climate polluter you are. And as we can see, on the right-hand side, China, the big blue, is currently the world's biggest emitter of CO2 pollution. Uh, following in second place on the left is the United States, right? And so by far, the two of our two countries uh, are the biggest. India and Russia were third and fourth. And for those of you who wondered about the Falkland Islands, they are in last place. So they, they are not guilty here. Um, all right, so on this question, when we think about who is more responsible for CO2 emissions, uh, I, I just uh, show you uh, what we just saw. But in the left-hand pie chart, it shows, of course, China's the, the biggest player the US, about 14 or 15 percent. But, and this is the way the United States politicians have looked at things by saying, hey, we don't really, it makes no sense for us to act on climate change because the Chinese are the ones that are putting it all up there today. 
Uh, in the meantime, we can look at a different way that maybe the Chinese would look at it and say, hey, from 1751 to 2013, look at all the cumulative emissions that have been put up there. You guys in the United States have put the most of it up there, 25%. Uh, this is because CO2 is a very long-lived gas. It, it will stay up there for centuries. It doesn't dissipate just in days. And so everything we put up in the 1750s, a lot of it is still there. So um, this is the reason that China will say, look, we're not going to do anything first unless you Americans do something first, because you had a 100-year head start in putting it up there. Uh, another way to look at the same data is to ask ourselves, well, per capita, who's the country most uh, polluting with CO2? And here you can see in the bar on the left, United States. The UK is the pink one in the middle there. So Germany, Canada, those are all like the highest emitters per capita. And China and India are way below the global mean. Uh, China, in fact, is like 67th mo from a per capita basis in terms of intensity of uh, CO2 pollution per capita. So um, all right, let's do our second question now. True or false, a majority of adults agree that human activities are mostly the cause of global warming. Is this true? False. OK. So a uh, little, little bit of a trick question. Now, this is a survey of 20 countries around the world asking that same question. To what degree is climate change the result of human activity? And uh, sorry it's a little bit small, but I'll read you the answers. That the Chinese at the very top had 93% agreement with this statement. 5% disagreed. On the bottom was the United States. Out of 20 countries, only 54% agreed. And there was 32% disagreement. So six times more people disagreed with this statement in our country. But in America, 14% didn't understand the question. 14% <laughs> in America didn't understand. All right, that could be the case very well, even though it was in English. I don't know how the Chinese <laughs> understood it. Maybe they didn't understand it, the Chinese, what they were saying. But um, actually, joking aside, there are a lot of English language countries at the bottom here. And we can sometimes attribute the, the Western media, the English press, uh, Rupert Murdoch and the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, owned by him uh, is really publishing articles that tried to confuse the issue and say the climate crisis is not happening. But I show you these two slides anyways to share with you that the purpose of the quiz is to say who are the biggest polluters, who's most responsible, who can do something in the next 30 to 40 years. It's our country and it's China. And yet, the, we have very divergent viewpoints in, uh, amongst our populace of whether this is even a problem, right? The Chinese look at it one way, and the Americans look at it another. So uh, let me share with you just a, a set of slides for about um, 15 minutes. Uh, I'll share with you some pieces. Of, actually, Mr. Gore, Gore slides on facts around the climate crisis. We'll talk about the, the impacts as well as the solutions. And then we'll circle back at the very end of my talk about what is the implication for US-China uh, relations and sort of what is the theme of our discussion today. So let's go back in time 50 years to when this photograph was taken from the first of the manned Apollo missions in Christmas Eve 1968. This photograph showed our beautiful planet as we share all together, all humankind. And I think around that time is really as we started to see pictures of the Earth from outer space, we started to understand more about our planet and in fact, the first Earth Day started to become um, happening after, after these photos were taken. So what has happened to the temperature of the Earth since that period of time? This is an animation of global warming temperatures from the 1800s to the present, ever since weather instruments were made. And it shows that as we get to the 1950s, OK, yellow and orange are hotter than average. Blue and white are colder than average. And as we get to the 80s, the 1990s, 2000s, 2010, to the present, what's happening? We're seeing a lot more orange and yellow. It's getting a lot hotter just in the last couple decades. So um, in fact, 14 of the 15 hottest years ever recorded have all been since the year 2001, with the hottest year being, in fact, last year. 2015 was the hottest year ever recorded on weather instruments. Now, if we asked ourselves, uh, what about 2016? It seems sort of hot this week here in the Bay Area. Well, if we look at the last three record-breaking years in 2015, 2014, and 2010, over their last you know, January through December, you can see they were averaged like 0.8 centigrade above the mean. But in 2016, uh, we are already way above average 
And as we sit here in June, it's statistically 99% chance that this year, 2016, will yet again break the record of 2015 by far. So these are records that we don't like breaking. Um, let me share with you just a little bit of what's happening with our summertime temperatures. Uh, this is a series of charts that show the summer temperatures over 1951 to 1980. And at that time, it was sort of representative of a bar chart. It's sort of like the grading curve, right? Uh, where the middle there represents your average. The white is average temperature. Red are above average, and blue are colder than average temperatures. And as we advance in the decades and get from into the 80s, you can see that this chart starts to move as we get to the 1990s, 2005, and so forth. And what happens is that the average temperature, as represented by the top of the curve, the average is no longer white. The average temperature is actually already above average. It's the red area. So there's a much bigger preponderance of warmer days, even though there are some record-breaking cold days. So people can always point out, why was it so cold? Well, yeah, there are going to be some cold days. But by and large, the average is going much warmer. And um, there's this incidence in yellow now of extremely warm temperatures. And those used to be a very small, 0.1%. Now they're 14%. Of all, time, uh, of all incidences. So that's why we're seeing much more uh, um, disasters and storms, and I'm going to be talking about those a little later. Let me switch gears and, and ch show you this picture taken by the International Space Station of our Earth from an angle. And the purpose of this is to just show you the blue area there, which is our, our atmosphere. And the point of that is to say that our atmosphere is actually very thin. Sometimes when we go out on a beautiful day like today and we look up at the blue sky, we say, wow, that blue sky looks infinite. How could we little human beings, by just driving our car, and have any impact on this infinite sky? It's just like a drop in the bucket. But in truth, our atmosphere is very thin. It's like if I had an apple, the skin of the apple would be the relative thickness or thinness of our atmosphere as compared to the apple. So, if, uh, it's, so as humans, when we emit carbon dioxide fumes by burning uh, from our carbon uh, from, from coal-fired power plants, we can actually create extra pollution that uh, uh, sort of like a blanket blankets the earth and keeps us a bit warmer than we would like to be and insulates the planet and makes it a bit warm. Now, there are many sources. I've been talking about CO2 so far, carbon dioxide, but there are actually many forms of greenhouse gases in addition to carbon dioxide that are uh, holding the temperature higher. And I've put some of them here. We don't have time to go into it all. But I just want to say that the uh, fossil fuel bit is the most impactful, as we can see from the, the very first oil drill that was drilled in Pennsylvania in 1850 to the present. Our societies have used a lot more car coal and fuels since that time. In fact, the energy trap now by man-made global warming inclusion is equivalent to 400,000 Hiroshima-style atomic bombs exploding every day Every three <laughs> so the temperatures are going up. Here's a photograph in China. They've had the last three summers really record-breaking temperatures, 113 degrees there in Shandong. This is a, a big... Uh, Everybody racing to the pool or the oceans to, to cool off that summer. Uh, he's uh, hugging a big chunk of ice. Even the animals uh, don't like it. And uh, there's, there's a student making use of a manhole cover to cook his breakfast, I guess. And uh, a lady who's cooking some meat on the back of a car. It was so hot back then. So some pretty unusual impacts and creative individuals. Uh, dealing with the, the heat. Now, China was not the only place that suffered from the heat. In Iran last year, it was 165 degrees heat index. Could probably only last outside for five or 10 minutes under such conditions. So let me change gears again and talk about how th these warming temperatures have uh, caused extreme weather events and some of the impacts. And it's very important to understand that as the temperature warms, the, the fundamental aspect is that warmer air holds more water vapor. And the uh, equation for that is pretty simple. It's for each one degree centigrade of temperature rise, the atmosphere holds 7% uh, more water vapor. 
Actually, every time we get out of the shower, we understand this because we, where's the steam when we get out of the shower? It's in the top part of the shower. That holds more water vapor. The bottom of the shower holds less. So students and we, we can understand this from our own daily use. And so there's already 4% more water vapor over the oceans today for over the last 30 years, compared to 30 years ago based on the temperature rises that we've talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, and so when it does rain, and here's a picture of a rainstorm in Montana, you see all the water coming down from there. It's actually not really coming from the part of the sky right above this cloud. Just like this bathroom analogy that I talked about. If we had a bathtub and I pulled the plug out of the bathtub and the water goes rushing down that tub, is the water going down the tub coming from the portion of the drain right above the drain or is it coming from the whole tub, right? Well, of course, it's coming from the whole tub and if you add 4% more water, if you add more and more water to the tub, there's going to be more and more water going down the drain. And so when we see these types of heavy rainstorms like this, the moisture is coming, in this case from Montana, it's coming from as far as 1,000 miles away in Mexico all the way up to Canada. And so it's like a big bathtub and there's more moisture in the air and so more moisture comes down when it rains or when it snows when we heard about that big Boston snowstorm. <laughs> Storms, and you can see the damage being caused. And um, elsewhere in the world, India had severe storms in 2013. These are all like record breaking floods, 100 year floods, 200 year floods that have really never been seen before. Uh, and nowadays with uh, social media and everybody's ability to tape what's going on, we actually have a lot more visibility into seeing these crises all over the world as they're happening. This is in China. Here's oh. in Florida. Oh my god. Oh. Is someone in there? Please, there's someone in there. Oh my god. That particular storm moved up the coast. Oh my God, it's going down. It's moving. It's moving. Oh. 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 And uh, there is, just look at some of the damages. Here's the, the actual calculations by the insurance agencies and all the damages that have been happening. They go back to the past 30 years and show that um, in 1980, there were probably like 300 events that were catastrophic, weather-related catastrophes. But that number has tripled over 900, almost 1,000 really, by this past year. So the statistics also show an increasing number of these crises worldwide. Uh, let me change gears and talk a little bit. We've talked a lot about moisture coming down, but um, I want to talk about how you can have droughts at the same time that you have too much rain. That's because that warm air also sucks moisture out of the soil and creates uh, deeper droughts. Uh, currently here in the state of California, this is from just a week ago, even though we've had a semi-El Nino event here, 84% of the, our state is still in a drought, 21% in exceptional drought. And um, elsewhere in the world, last year, Brazil uh, has had a serious droughts that they haven't seen in hundreds of years with 140 cities rationing water back then. And uh, in Africa, a situation very dire for people who need water. Can you imagine having to, to go hunt for water? It's, it's uh, really depressing to see that. Uh, when there is drought, you also see an increased number of fires that are occurring because uh, the, the foliage so dry. So here in California, we've seen a number of fires over the last year. And there are fires all over the world. Don't have time to show you all the pictures, but uh, just some images to share the, the, what's happening around the world. This is not just a few countries. Uh, the drought in the Mediterranean, let me just touch on that. It's their worst drought in 900 years. Uh, this is a farmer in Syria who had 400 acres of wheat. And after four years of their drought, he was 
pretty much devastated. He had lost all of his wheat. What's been, we read about Syria in the news. You may be reading about it with your students and the crisis in Syria. Uh, many point to the fact that the climate crisis and the droughts have forced those farmers to move to urban areas and put incredible pressure. The urban people said, don't, we don't want you here. Go out and, and causing really the civil war we see. Um, so yeah, if, if you looked at that five-year period, 60% of Syria's fertile land turned into a desert. 1.5 million people moved in the cities. And now the, the Syrians are trying to find ways to emigrate. This is a photograph of Croatia from last fall, right? And here in America, are we going to take the Syrian refugees or not? You can really think of the impact. This is just one country. What if it's happening all over the world? If people are, you have climate refugees uh, fleeing and the type of chaos that would, will be causing us. In fact, the US Defense Department here published a report, and they've been very good about regular reports showing that talking about the climate crisis and the impacts on food and water shortage, pandemic diseases, refugee crisis, and so they are very concerned. Uh, speaking about tropical di diseases, as the temperature gets warmer, you see warm temperature diseases also jumping and spreading to different places. Uh, this shows like the West Nile virus or the Zika virus uh, expanding beyond their sort of normal native areas into places like America. Uh, I took this picture on the BART system not long ago to see, oh, the West Nile virus, in fact, has already arrived here. Uh, in China, we can see the consequences of air pollution on their cities. Here's a clear day in China compared to a um, not so clear day. The lifetime of uh, the life expectancy of Chinese is actually five and a half years shorter in the north compared to the rest of the country. And um, the pollution index, this is what the Shanghai Academy of Social Science says, it's no longer livable for human beings in Beijing. Can you imagine a mayor of a city saying, my city is not livable? That's uh, beyond incredible. I took, th this is my iPhone showing on Christmas Eve last year a pollution index of 500. Now today is a spare the air day in the Bay Area. How many people knew that when they showed? What, what, is it, what does spare the air day mean in terms of the index? What's the number that triggers that? 100. In the California, if we hit 100, that's when we start worrying and we send the signals up. This was 500 in, in Beijing, so you can see how far there, beyond spare the air it was for them on Christmas. So this has got to stop. This uh, level of pollution is terrible. We're already losing 50% of our species, uh, expected to lose species this century. And um, already 49% of vertebrates have been declining in the oceans. Land-based animals and species are already moving because of the climate changes 15 feet per day towards the poles, either north or south. Uh, the Muir Glacier, this was a picture taken in the 1880s as compared to today, and it's gone. And some of that uh, result is that if we see more glaciers melting, then we'll see sea level rise. Here are the top 10 cities, many in the US and in Asia, that will be impacted from the climate crisis. I was in Miami last fall in October, and they had this regular event called the, the Thai Tide. This is actually not in my range for when the oceans are at their feet. And they literally have fish swimming in the sea, and people are actually quite used to this situation because uh, the oceans are already working. And uh, that, that's something that unfortunately they're getting, they're getting used to. Uh, China will also suffer from this, Guangzhou. Here's a picture of Beijing it, fast forwarding into the next uh, 50 to 100 years of their impact, and Shanghai, same sort of thing of what would happen with sea level rises in the Shanghai region. In the Bay Area here, I, I took this snapshot to just show that by 2100, the, with a 10-foot level of sea rise, which is what is expected in a two degree, two degree centigrade rise situation, both our airports, the Oakland and San Francisco airports, would be underwater. And this facility here in Redwood Shores, we would be underwater as well. Uh, elsewhere in the world, we're already seeing the impacts in Bangladesh. Uh, sea level rises are flooding the plains. And in Egypt, uh, that salt water, when it rises up, it actually makes the land infertile. And you're not able to grow your crops. So there's a huge impact, especially in the Nile Delta. Which is <laughs> so there is a cost of pollution at the top of the I just touched on some very quickly. Uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos this year, the attendees voted to say that the worst thing they're worried most, the number one threat to the global economy, 
is the climate crisis. So it's good that we're getting a lot more attention on the climate crisis this year, even through our own elections, right? Um, I'm a little bit, uh, yeah, let me just uh, touch on an interesting topic about the subprime bubble. And this is a, a look at all the fossil fuels we've burned to date over the last 150 years, and the amount we've actually burned since the year 2000 is there. What we know of the re proven reserves of fossil fuels is here in the red, and this is the amount, our carbon budget, how much we could burn if we were to stay within a two degrees centigrade warming scenario. You can see that that middle bubble is only the amount we burned since the year 2000, the last 15 years. That's why I said we probably only have 15, 20, or 30 more years to solve this problem because that's the amount of carbon that we have left to burn before things get too hot. The rest is really unburnable. The good news is that we actually have solutions on hand already. Uh, wind power is growing as a fast resource here, our own Altamont Pass. California has been a leader in that. The, the amount of wind capacity has been growing dramatically in the last couple decades, uh, commensurate with the reduction of cost in building those wind farms. Uh, it's estimated that wind alone <coughs> can, can deliver 40 times the amount of electricity that the world needs, uh, it by itself. And China is actually a major producer of wind uh, equipment. Here are just some pictures of them building solar uh, wind farms in various parts of China. Uh, if you look at the top countries in 2015 who deployed wind, China deployed almost half of the world's wind resources. The U.S. was second. And um, the, in terms of manufacturing of wind, China also produced almost half of the world's wind turbines in, in, the, in the recent years. The USA is also in second place. And so can countries be 100% renewable? Well, Germany last fall generated 81% of their electric needs from renewable sources from the grid, and um, China today is ranked number one in the world in terms of how much power they're generating from solar. You can see here the growth of solar energy has been sharp since the year 2008, and as it shows sort of the, the decline of cost of solar cells have gone from $80 a watt down to say 70 cents a watt, a 99% decrease in just the last 30, 40 years. Uh, China makes 78% of all solar panels today, and um, here, just now, Japan is in second place. So there, the China is a leader in this clean energy space. That's my point. And their products are showing up all over the world in places like Bangladesh to um, a hut there, Costa Rica in a larger scale. Ninety-nine percent of its electricity was from new renewables last year. In the United States, we're adding two, a new solar farm every two and a half minutes. And the good news here in the state of California is that we passed a bill requiring the state to get 50% of its electricity from new renewables by 2030. And uh, so Jerry Brown has been pushing for that. The Vatican is the, the first country to announce that they want to be carbon neutral. Uh, they, we know that they have two advantages, though. Number one, <laughs> they're very small. And number two, God is on their side. <laughs> so. Yeah, indeed. So solar energy's benefit has that every hour of every day is enough to fulfill the entire world's energy needs for a full year. That's an incredible concept. And if we can continue to harness it, it indeed can be part of our solution. So I really, there, there are three questions to just summarize so far what, what we've learned today. Number one, must we act? Must we do something? Yes, the climate crisis is here. It has terrible impact. We must act and do something. Can we act? Yes, we can. There are solutions in wind and solar and other renewables. So the final question is really just, will we act? Will we do something about this? And I, I would say, do we have the will to act? But also, who's we? Who's we that could act? And I go back to our original slide and say, who is we? Who are the people who need to act? It's the, the biggest bubbles on this chart have to act. It's the US and China that need to, to be the ones to act. And um, I'm very hopeful about that because the good news is that um, the U.S. and China have started to act. They had, they had been at loggerheads for 20 years of locked up negotiations. But in 2014, Xi Jinping and President Obama agreed for the first time ever to step up and put emissions caps. And the United States specifically said that we would target to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 2025, and China agreed to peak its CO2 emissions around 2030, if not earlier, 
and to boost its non-fossil fuel energy by 20% uh, by that year. So as a result of the US and China agreeing to that, the UN Paris climate talks, which happened in Dece December of last year, uh, was very successful. It was the first time that 195, oh, 200 nations agreed unanimously that the climate crisis needed to be solved and resolved to do something about it. And it would not have happened if not for US-China's leadership on this topic. In the US, we've made good progress. This is a look at the number of coal plants that were proposed and defeated, retired, or announced retirement. In total, almost every single coal plant has been eliminated from the, plant, the charts in the last decade. And um, if we look at the amount of new electricity that's been installed in the US, you can see almost 3 quarters is renewables. And oil and coal are very small percentages uh, to that mix. Now, since we're in election year, somebody talked about the elections. I wanted to sh play you a, a TV commercial that's running today. Your students will see this. Uh, uh, that's running on CNN. Let's see what that is. Vote America is taking the lead in energy. Leading the world in oil and natural gas production. I vote to keep it going with the right policies. We can produce, refine, and supply more oil and natural gas. And more abundant energy means more affordable energy for American families. A more secure America. Jobs. Opportunity and economic growth. For our children and grandchildren. That's why this election I'm voting for American energy. Learn more at VoteForEnergy.com. Org. Join us and become an energy voter. Anybody see this or similar ads? Watch CNN. Okay, so what is, what's the thought? That pretty feel-good ad, right? It's like, wow, that's something good. Well, that's the U that's the Petroleum Institute's ad saying, you want jobs, right? Jobs are important, so let's let's keep burning fossil fuels so that we can have jobs. Uh, interesting discussion point. Uh, I was in Beijing a few weeks ago, and another reason for hope is uh, I attended the climate realities training of 700 uh, clim new climate leaders in Shenzhen, China. And um, out of the 33 trainings that have been had in the last decade, this one had the youngest average age in the early 20s. And it says to me that the Chinese youth in China are very interested in solving the climate crisis. In fact, the boy that sat next to me who has just graduated from college I asked him after he had heard a two and a half hour presentation by Al Gore, I said, what did you think of that presentation? And he, guess what he said? He said, I already knew all that. <laughs> what I'm interested in though is what are we going to do about it? Aww. Right? And I was like taking, I said, wow, that, that's pretty amazing that these kids nowadays, they don't have to be convinced that the climate crisis is here. They want to take action. And that made me feel very hopeful that, um, that they get it and that something's going to be done. So, let me, conclude, let me just conclude and bring it together. I, I, clearly, the US-China bilateral relationship is one of the most important relationships in, in the world. There are so many reasons that we're fighting and arguing with each other. I'm sure you've covered that yesterday from the South China Sea trade disputes. They're stealing our jobs. You know, they're manipulating their currencies. Cybersecurity, right? There are all these negative reasons out there about our relationship. But on the positive side, there are really strong areas of collaboration. And climate change has been one of the bright points, one of the real great areas for, to focus on together. And youth also have been a positive point. And so to us in this room who are dealing with youth and who care about the climate crisis, this is very fertile ground for your students and for yourself to get involved in this topic because it really, it, it, the leaders in both our country, in the US and China, and youth are the ones that will be needed to solve this problem. So uh, with that, I, we are back to our initial slide and looking at our earth that we share together. And I want to thank you all for your attention today. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wei Tai. Before he takes questions, I want to very quickly introduce one of our board members who uh, came in just a short while ago, Mary Lou, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Mrs. Collins, uh, Margaret Lou Collins, who is the benefactor of the Les lesson plan contest. And <laughs> We're going to have that again this year. You know, we got winners last year, and we hope to have winners again. And thank you so much for your generous donation, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions now for a way tie. Questions. Thank you. That was easily one of the best um, uh, PowerPoints I've seen in a really long time. Um, it very, wasn't very mine, it was Al's, but I'll let him know he said that. <laughs> <Thank> exceptionally <you. laughs> clear. 
Um, yesterday, uh, Jessica made a reference that one of her projects for the Paulson Institute, I believe, was uh, to connect youth to youth for environmental awareness. Um, branching off of that, or uh, that ge general topic, is what are your recommendations that teachers can do to help um, in, uh, invest new habits of mind and for our, our students? Great, great, great question. Thank you very much. What can, I, I noticed as I looked at the uh, table tents that many of you are social science teachers. Is that, is that correct? And I, there, I would make one observation uh, about the climate crisis and global warming. Um, some have observed that in the last 50 years, the natural sciences have done their job in identifying the rise of temperatures, identifying the cause in CO2, discovering what greenhouse gases are, understanding parts per million. They have done their job. 99% of climate scientists agree this is happening. The baton is now being passed to the social scientists. Like, what are we going to do about it? What policies, what laws, international relations? How do we communicate it? How do we get people on board, right? Uh, there is a natural bridge that the, the baton to get us to the finish line now relies on our will to act, on the social sciences, the people. So to all of you, I would, I would appeal to you to find ways that you can be involved in this with your students uh, and to get them involved. As I mentioned, the ch uh, China, Youth are interested in this topic. I hope that your California youth will be more and more interested in this. And if there are ways that we can bridge that, I think it's actually a decade, couple decades worth of very fertile ground to be working together on, on this topic. So I, I, I think that no matter what creative ideas you, work, you happen upon, the bigger trend is that that work is very important and will be rewarding for your students and for you just as it has been for me. I was not a public speaker on climate change five years ago. I was an advertising executive, right? What am I doing here? But, I don't, but we all get involved and we find ways to be part of the solution and find creative ways to, to uh, be part of the solution. So thanks for the question. All right. Hi, uh, just turning things back to China a little bit. You were talking about how there's a huge acknowledgement in China that there is a problem and that they have these forward thinking plans to a degree about how they're going to cap things by 2030 and so forth. But practically speaking right now, has that actually affected what they are doing in terms of uh, building and their attempt to keep the economy growing at the rate that was talked about yesterday? Have they actually done things to stem pollution and so forth in the present? Or is it all lofty long term? Yeah, that's great. Is it just, uh, is it just cheap talk or is it happening? I mean, I think you've heard that China's not top down like Let's just make it happen, and it does, right? It's still a very complex system. Uh, in 2014, though, China did peak its coal usage, so it plateaued, which is unbelievable for an economy that's been headed upwards. The, exp the reason why Xi Jinping did not say that starting now we'll be going down is because they expect until 2030 that they'll keep adding coal-fired plants, even though the, the, the practical aspect is that they have actually peaked, and they're going to try to push it down, but they didn't want to make that commitment globally. Uh, I will say that I was in uh, Hebei province two weeks ago visiting steel plants, melting the steel with coal. And I, I asked them, I said, you know, what, do you, do you, how do you melt this steel? Do you, uh, do you just burn coal and use the thermal heat? And they said, no, the government is cracking down on all of us. We have to convert to electric steel furnaces and use electricity, which could be generated by wind and solar. We, none of us, you know, are, we're suffering so much because all of our, our, our factories are being shut down. So just a sort of a small story just to explain that, yeah, I think they're doing it. It's not like the magic wand that will happen, but I, they've made good progress, and I think the intent is there. So thank you for that question. Yes, over on that side. The um, so I'm from a small town in Ohio where jobs are really scarce, hence I moved to California. What do you say to those in America and in China who are going to lose their jobs from these century-old coal mining jobs? Or um, what, what can you move to when you're in a small town in China or America? What do you replace that with? Because the solar companies, they're in big cities. There's nothing really in the small areas, which make up a lot of both our countries. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question on the dislocation of industries as we migrate from one a form of energy to a, a new form of energy. And I think that's really where the government can step in to try to 
bridge the gap and create job training and education programs because we recognize that in West Virginia or Ohio, the, you know, what, solar will be available every, is available everywhere. It's not actually just in big cities. It's actually uh, in every state. It can happen everywhere. But in West Virginia, maybe there are not millions of solar jobs, right, for, to, to, to take over. So I do think that's something that we have to try to find a bridge for those individuals who have been in those industries. But that, could, that shouldn't stop us. You know, we can't sacrifice the future of our children and everybody because of uh, just that. We've got to find ways to make them whole. Very good. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I know one of the, I mean, oftentimes the outcomes from these climate talks is um, agreements on financing for mitigation and adaptation projects, particularly in, in developing regions. Can you summarize really quickly what came out of the Paris Accords, especially with China and the US maybe committing financing to these types of projects, and how feasible do you think that is for the US, for instance, to pass right. in Congress? Like. Right. So, meet those agreements. yeah, the question is, uh, what about mitigation? Uh, so how do you, um, there, there's certainly negative impact happening from the climate crisis. Shouldn't the big rich countries who caused all of this pay money to the poor countries who had, didn't do anything? Uh, that is the most contentious and difficult issue that over the past 20 years that climate negotiators have had to face because the U.S. and China don't want to pay that. Uh, verbally, they, they do say they do, uh, and I'd say one of the, while the Paris climate talks were extremely successful, never before have we had 195 countries agree to do something, the one area that was felt not, not enough ground was, uh, was on was that, what about the green fund to, to you know, funding us poor countries to, to, because we don't have money to go do all these things we need to do. So I think that's uh, a, an area that needs to be worked on for the next five, ten years until we can get more involved. So yes, certainly, uh, certainly a great question. Thank you. One last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, you talked about uh, how much energy we could generate with solar and wind, take care of all the energy we need forever. And um, the question really is not, you know, where are we going to find the money to do that? It's about how are we going to create opportunities to do that? And I work with uh, smart cities groups, and and they gather data in cities and what what the smart cities council, the global smart cities council, has observed. We have enough data about opportunities for jobs and for job creation, applying solar, wind, energy efficiency, and creating new uh, kinds of uh, services for cities and for communities. The jobs are just waiting for us entrepreneurs, creative people, to just think of how we can create a new model to create the job. The jobs are all there. The data's there, it says it's there. But what we need to do is to get our students and ourselves and our neighbors to thinking about, okay, how can we rethink this problem and create a new job, a new business, and put solar, wind, and, and clean energy to work? Right. It's sort of a new paradigm. Of, and, and I think that's one thing that youth are great at. They don't accept the, the status quo. They're just like into the next thing. And I think that that's why I have great hope that the youth are going to help drive it. I actually, three years ago, I was not focused on speaking to youth audiences because I thought I had to, spoke to speak to adults and voters. But the more I'm out here, I realize that the kids get it way better than the adults. And actually, I'm more hopeful about them than talking to adults. Um, I love talking to teachers, too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, so let me close by, I put my uh, contact information on the board here. If any of you or your students are interested in having a presenter like myself come to your classroom and give presentation, there are 100 trained speakers like myself in the San Francisco Bay Area. There are 10,000 people like me worldwide that volunteer at no charge to come to speak to community groups. And uh, so contact me and I can hook you up there. I could come to your school if you're nearby where I live. And we'd be pleased to uh, come and give a 20-minute presentation, 30-minute presentation in your classroom. So Don't hesitate to take up his offer. Yes, okay? exactly. So thank you, Wei Tai. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.